Where do we start, I thought, in looking at prophecies about Jesus? So what I'm going to do, I'm going to start off, first of all, with the birth of Jesus, so we get Jesus established. And then I'm going to use the, the speech that Peter made um, on the day of uh, Pentecost to look at how he related what Jesus did to prophecies. So we have a sort of guide, so that we, we have Peter as a guide where we're going. Now, the birth of Jesus. First of all, uh, the angels come to Mary. And I just want to pick up what they say to her. You will be with child and give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great and be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. And then a little bit later, when we go into Luke chapter 2, and we have the angel speaking to the shepherds, this is what the angel says to the shepherds. The angel said to them, Do not be afraid, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Saviour has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Uh, Glory be to God, uh, said the heavenly host, appeared to the angel, saying him. And what uh, the angels talked about, it was this... Uh, this good news, this salvation which was to come through this child. So what I want to say is just at the birth of Jesus we've got these two main things spoken of. The kingship of Jesus and his role as a saviour. So we've got the two main things of the role of Jesus Christ set for us. So what I want to do it seems to me that when we look at uh, the life of Jesus there are three um, principal events which actually happen uh, with the Lord Jesus which are crucial to these two uh, roles of Jesus of kingship and saviour and they are crucifixion resurrection and kingship and I'm trying to reduce it into bits that we can just hold and of course with kingship there is bound up the thought of his second coming so I, I'm not sort of going into that because I think we'd have too much to look at because so much Jesus encompasses the whole purpose of God so we're going to look at those three things follow each other crucifixion resurrection and kingship and we're going to follow it through this speech of the Apostle Peter which we have in the Acts of the Apostles so in Acts chapter 2 which we've read together verse 22 he said men of Israel Listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders and signs, which God did among you through him. As you yourselves know, this man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge. And that's important. Jesus was handed over by the set knowledge and for set purpose and foreknowledge of God with the help of wicked men to put him to death by nailing him to the cross. That's the crucifixion that Peter is actually looking at. Um, so I want to look at two things to do with the crucifixion. I want to look at two prophecies. The first one is in the Psalms, and it's Psalm 22. And this is what the psalmist says. Thinking of the Saviour, thinking of the death, the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is what he says about it. In Psalm 22, I'm looking at verse, verses just 16 and 18. <coughs> Dogs have surrounded me. A band of evil men has encircled me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. People stare and gloat at me. They've divided my garments among them, cast lots for my clothing. What I'm looking at there, it seems to me, is where... the, the the psalmist as a prophet is looking at the, the manner of the death of Jesus and I think most commentators would agree they're looking at something which looks forward to, to a form of crucifixion 
why did it happen in that way? We're looking at just the mechanics, if you like, of the death of Jesus. And it seems to me it was highly important that Jesus suffered crucifixion by the Romans. Why that? The Romans were a very legalistic people, very precise in what they were doing, very precise in their judgments and their um, the, the punishments they meted out. So we have with Jesus two things happening. First of all, he was pronounced by Pilate after a Roman judgment that he was innocent and without fault. And that seems to me important. That a Roman governor said, there is no fault in this man. But because of pressure, I'm handing him over to you Jews and you can put him to death. But it was put to death under Roman auspices. Now they had to make sure that Jesus actually was dead. So there are two facts about the crucifixion of Jesus. One, that he was absolutely innocent. And two, he was actually dead according to Roman law. They pierced him just to make sure. They are the facts of what happened. And if you look at things, they are evidence that that actually took place. But we need to know what took place, what was actually going on in what took place. What was actually happening that's what's important to us. And to get that, we have to go to the prophecy of Isaiah. And this was what actually, what was happening in those events. We have the fact that Jesus was put to death and he was innocent. But Isaiah tells us what God was going to accomplish, what Jesus was accomplishing in that death. Look at Isaiah, there were no words. Isaiah 53, I'm going to start at, um, at verse 5 because it picks up um, what was being said in the, in, in the psalm. So Isaiah 53 and verse 5. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him and by his wounds we are healed. A bit about us. All we like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. And then back to what God was doing with the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Now that was what was actually taking place in those actual factual things of a man being pronounced innocent and put to death. And this is what's important to us. Because we read that piercing was for our transgressions. The bruising was for what the prophet calls our iniquities. And what did that crucifixion bring for us? Two things. It brought us peace and it brought us healing. A beautiful way in which Isaiah expresses that and it also summarizes what God was doing overall, that he was laying on him the iniquity of us all. So we really have to say to ourselves, well, what is this peace and this healing that Jesus was bringing through this crucifixion? Why do we need healing? And, and what, I want to look at, if you, if you go back to the peace, it's this shalom, and for, for the Jews it would have been total well-being, not just total well-being, but a total harmony with God. So Jesus was accomplishing something by dealing with our iniquities, those bits of us 
all of us that has gone wrong, is dealing with us so that we're healed, as if we've got wounds, as if we needed healing. I want to go to uh, Paul's letter to the Colossians to actually clear up, to have Paul tell us what did that actually mean? What was it actually accomplishing? What's this healing? What's this peace actually about? What's it, what has it done for us? And I'm looking at, at uh, his letter to the Colossians, and in the first chapter of that, I'm looking at verse 19, where he starts to look at, uh, he's been looking at the Lord Jesus, and he's looking at this very crucifixion, this very bringing of peace, this very bringing of healings. And I'm looking, starting at verse, Colossians chapter 1, verse 19. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. He's talking about the Lord Jesus. And through him... To reckon to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behaviour. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. That is huge, it seems to me. That what Paul is saying, if you look at what was actually Isaiah is talking about, is that through that crucifixion, he was making peace, this total harmony. And he describes it as being reconciled to God. Now, I find this absolutely fascinating and interesting and moving. Because what he's saying is, because of our behaviour we broke a relationship with God we broke it and God has said I want to mend that relationship and you can't do it you can't mend this relationship so I will provide a means of reconciliation and I'm going to do it through giving my son my son is going to pour out his life for you and eventually literally pour out his life on the cross and bring about this peace and healing which is reconciliation what I find absolutely fascinating we very briefly this morning looked at the flood and the, the, the um, covenant relationship that God established with Moses and, and, uh, through Noah and in that covenant the whole of the creation was involved and that's what Paul is saying here this reconciliation is not just for humans it's for the totality of God's creation because this is the place where the whole of God's salvation for us is placed within this world within this orbit I was very fascinated by somebody who was speaking on the wireless not so long ago who was talking about um, ecology things and he suddenly said you know we should care about this world because after all in God's purpose this is where we're going to live forever and so it's not extraordinary and this is what Paul is saying here the, the, the reconciliation is about the totality of God's creation everything he's made and the, the environment in which we live so this is about reconciliation the mending of a relationship between God and us and of course what we see involved in that is a, a process of transformation because if you think about it if there's going to be a relationship which we broke somehow we need to be changed so that we're more in harmony and Paul leaps ahead and actually saying I'm going to make this transformation it's going to be so great he said that you are going to be able to be holy in God's sight without any blemishes and such that nobody's going to be able to point the finger at you and say Alan I know all about you I know what you did nobody's going to do that because of the transformation. Now I know that's putting it's putting in a, a tight little pocket, if you like. But what an incredible uh, um, summation of what Jesus accomplished by His crucifixion, by God's grace. So if that was what He got by the crucifixion, 
what about this resurrection? What part does that play? Well, Jesus, uh, Paul, Peter, sorry, spoke a lot about this um, resurrection because he, he speaks about the fact the grave was not possible to hold him, doesn't he? And so we're back with Peter and he's speaking in uh, Acts chapter 2, uh, verse 24, first of all. And he says there, God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was not possible for death to keep its hold on him. And he goes back to David and David talks about, um, my heart will rejoice and be glad. My body also will live in hope because you will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let your Holy One see corruption. And then later on in verse 31, Seeing what was ahead, he spoke of the resurrection of Christ, that he was not abandoned to the grave, nor did his body seek decay. And Peter says, what David was talking about was talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, why was that resurrection so important? We've already established, haven't we, that God, in fulfilling his prophecies, made it absolutely certain because Jesus was put to death by the Romans, that he was perfect and was dead. So there'd be no query that when Jesus reappeared, he had been raised from the dead. That was absolutely clear. Which is what Peter's saying here. We've seen him. He was raised from the dead. What did that raising from the dead actually mean? Well, First of all, we just need to go back to the prophecy that Peter was quoting, which again is another psalm. Sometimes we don't often think of the psalms as being prophets, but they, David was a prophet. And it's, it's Psalm 16 that, that, uh, David's, um, that Peter's quoting from. Psalm 16, and just a couple of verses from that psalm. And you recognise it because they're the words, because Peter is actually is quoting from verses 9 and 10 of, of, um, of Psalm 16. My heart is glad, my tongue rejoices, my body also will rest secure, because you will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. And Peter's saying, that was a prophecy of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what does that resurrection mean for us? If his crucifixion means reconciliation with God and our transformation, what does the resurrection mean for us? Well, we need to go to Paul again. And when he wrote his first letter to the Corinthians in chapter 15, he wrote about the, the resurrection. He wrote about the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ and the meaning of that resurrection for each of us. Um, it goes to a long argument about um, Jesus being raised from the dead. I'm going in towards the end of the, well, halfway through the, the chapter at verse 20. And he says, But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead also comes to a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all were made alive. But each in his own turn. Christ the firstfruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him. What does that mean for us? Reconciliation leads to resurrection from the dead. And it's resurrection to those who believe in Christ. It's the, Paul is saying, it's the affirmation that just as Jesus was raised from the dead, so also those who believe in Christ will be made alive. In other words, what he's saying is, Death is only an interlude, shall I say, in the process for the believer. Death doesn't intervene with God fulfilling his purpose. 
that's what he's actually saying Christ is the first fruit he's the proof that God can and will do this which we need because if we've been reconciled with God where is this leading where is it taking us we've got the reconciliation of God where are we going within this regulation this reconciliation where are we going in this renewed relationship with God and the first thing to be removed obviously there has to be death which would end and he actually says in some places if in this life only we've got hope he says we're miserable and he's saying here no it's not death doesn't actually matter so that's got to lead us on somewhere and actually fact, Paul starts to talk about that because when he says he's the first fruits then when he comes and he's again talking about the second return of Jesus those who belong to him will be raised then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom to God and he starts talking about the kingdom so he's moved into the kingship of Jesus so we need to go back to Peter again don't we you need to go back to Peter. And this is the final, what I call, significant event of these prophecies of Jesus. And it's about th th this kingdom. It's in Acts chapter 2 again. Peter doesn't make a lot of it, but it, it's actually there. In uh, Let's look at verse 30 and 31 of Acts chapter 2. Um, and then he says but he was a prophet and he's talking about David and knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne now what's he referring to he's referring to something that his listeners would have known a lot about he's referring back to David and he's referring back to a promise which God made to David and it's obviously to do with the the kingship of David and we have to go right back to the life of David to pick this up and we have to go back to pick that up uh, to the, the second book of Samuel and there we're going in at, uh, chapter, chapter 7 and the prophet is talking to David and making in my Bible it's got, it's got God's promise to David and that's what Peter was referring back to this is the prophecy about this kingship of the Lord Jesus Christ and second, and just one verse in 2 Samuel 7 verse 12 that we want to look at when your days are over and you rest with your fathers I will raise up your offspring to succeed you who will come from your own body and I will establish his kingdom he is the one who will build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever I will be his father and he shall be my son and David knew at the end of his life that Jesus was that God was speaking of a long while to come and Peter is picking up this prophecy here, this promise, this covenant with David and saying, this refers to the Lord Jesus Christ. He was raised because he was to fulfill this role of kingship. Now here, of course, we're moving into the future, which I suppose is a tingle factor for us in a sense, because it's telling us where we're going. Because if we have Jesus through his crucifixion we have reconciliation with God through his resurrection we have confirmation that this will continue that death will not stop it then what are we looking forward to what, what is this kingship actually about I didn't know where to go so I've gone I thought yes, as we're in a week in which we shall be having some very interesting happenings about who will be getting setting up the new government for us in the UK and who will be taking power. I thought it would be very good to have what I would see almost as the, the manifesto of the kingdom that Jesus is going to set up. It's in Isaiah chapter 2 and I think it's absolutely a fascinating one because it covers so many things I'm just going to look at this because it seems to me this contains so much and it's so simple and so straightforward this is what the kingship of Jesus is going to do it actually 
indicates and shows to us that this kingship is worldwide. It's not confined to a small space. It's, it's confined to the world. It's in Zion chapter 2, and um, oh, starting at verse 2. In the last days, we're looking ahead, says Isaiah. This is a prophecy for the future regarding Lord Jesus Christ. The mount of the Lord's temple will be established as chief among the mountains. It will be raised above the hills, and all nations will stream to it. Many people will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mount of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways, so that we may walk in his paths. The law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge between the nations and will settle disputes for many peoples. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation would not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war any more. What a manifesto! Look what it covers. Yes, we're told where the central seat of this government is going to be. It's going to be, surprised if you don't know it, from, from the city of Jerusalem. But look what it covers. Just let's look at it. People are going to come because they want to learn of God's ways. That sounds a very simple statement, doesn't it? But it's going, it's, people are going to say, God, how do you want us to live? What should we do? How should we behave? one with each other and they want to learn that now I suspect they want to learn that because they've been through coalitions they've been through parties and they've realized in actual fact try hard as human beings might with the best of intentions they can't bring this harmony and so people are saying here let's go and see what God says what does God say? How does he say we should, we should, we should live one with another? What, what does he actually say? And of course that's exactly what people who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ try to put in their life now because in a sense Jesus is their king now. But it's more than that, isn't it? Because not only is people's thinking changed because we're going to learn them, we're going to walk in his ways, we're going to actually walk in them. He's going to judge between the nations and settle disputes for many people. Well, we used to live next to somebody who worked for ACAS, and he was a negotiator during the miners' problems. And he used to tell us how he used to shuffle from across the corridor from one room to the other. They weren't actually speaking to each other. He was shuttling between one room and trying to bring harmony between these two groups. This is bigger than ACAS, isn't it? This is Jesus saying, I'm going to judge between nations and I'm going to settle their disputes. Just think what that means in our world today. I think it's mind-blowing to think, think that Jesus is saying, when I am ruling, I'm going to take the difficulties that the nations have one with another, I'm going to take the disputes that people have one with another, and they, go, they are going to be sorted. Sorted so much that when we look down beyond that, we have this beautiful well-known phrase, it isn't, it's just a bit that the BBC's got over its um, doorway. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. In other words, the, the occupation of people is going to be a peaceful occupation rather than the war activity. What a change in the occupations of the peoples of this world. If all of us were involved in peaceful activity rather than dispute war activity, activity, wouldn't that make a difference? Huge difference, it seems to me. And not only that, that's going to be so, says Jesus, says the prophet Isaiah, that um, the need for trainings for war is not going to exist anymore. That's how successful it's going to be. That's the future, 
And I think that's an incredible future that Jesus is going to bring about for us. So, what do these prophecies of Jesus mean for us? We've looked at the what I've called the three um, major events in the life of Jesus, which cover, I suppose, the, the purpose of God. I want to just read some comments of the Apostle John when he was writing um, his epistles. And in his first letter, the fourth chapter, I'm just going to read verses 9 and 10. And he says to us, This is how God showed his love amongst us. He sent his one only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. It was a revelation of God's love in which he talks about atoning sacrifice for sins. And there he's making reference to the reconciliation, as Paul called it. God sent his son so that we could be reconciled. The relationship could be renewed. That's what his love did. Because he loved us. Not because we loved him. Because he loved us. Our response to that love is that we should love. Now, what does that love make available to us? Let me just recap. Through crucifixion, reconciliation and transformation, a relationship with God restored. Through the resurrection, confirmation that those who believe and trust will be raised to a new life. Kingship, the new life, and renewed relationship with God eventually leads to a situation which John records in Revelation and it's a remarkable completion of what all this work. I'm reading from Revelation 21 verses 3 and 4. Just listen what it will be. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men and he will live with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for all, the old order of things has passed away. That's where we're aiming for. That's what all this is actually about. So that the dwelling of God can be with men. That's what a reconciliation of relationship is about. So that we can live together. That's where God has been intending to go all the time. God himself will be with them and be their God. And John says, and every tear we wipe from their eyes, no more death, no pain, no crying. All the painful things removed. Living in harmony with God. And that's what the new life is actually about. So it seems to me we have a choice. And God has never ever forced things upon us. He's never made us. He doesn't want a lot of robots. He wants people in a relationship who want to be in that relationship. I want to read to you some very well-known words which we hear very often. And Just look at the implication of these words. It's from John 3.16. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whosoever believes in him should not perish, there's our resurrection, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son to the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but men love darkness instead of light because of their evil deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be made exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what he has done has been done through God. You have a choice, God says. 
I've sent my son. I've given him. I've told you through prophecies what he's going to do. I've told you what those three main events actually mean. I've told you the end through John and Revelation. I've told you I've done this because I love you. Do you want it? It's a question we have to answer individually and it's simply put do I want a relationship with God? I can accept it or I can reject it. And God says the outcome is straightforward. If you reject it, you will live your life, whatever it is, whatever you make of it, and you will die. It will be the end. If you accept it, then death will just be a passing interlude because I will raise you from the dead so that you can be part of that glorious time when the shout goes up the dwelling of God is with men the old altar has passed away no more crying, no more pain, no more sorrow it's your choice I've made mine I struggle to be in allegiance to God and the Lord Jesus Christ because it's not easy but I want to be there at that time when God says, my dwelling is with you. I want a relationship with God. It's your choice. Mm -hmm.